Hi, everyone. In this recording, I will present the 2020 article titled Aggregation, Catra Heterogeneity, and the Investment cap -M, published at Review of Financial Studies. This is a joint paper with Andre Goncavis and Chen Xue. In this article, we demonstrate that a detailed treatment of aggregation and the capital heterogeneity substantially improves the performance of the investment cap -M in structural estimation. One motivation of our paper is an important critique in John Campbell's prominent textbook. Uh, he writes that this problem that different parameters are needed to fit each anomaly is a pervasive one in the Q-theoretic as a pricing literature. So we have a word of respect um, for Campbell and uh, uh, joins our academic leader. We take uh, his critique extremely ser seriously and strive to improve uh, our body of work. What John meant is the following. Um, so in the left table, we have table two from uh, Liu Wei Zhang. This is 2009 article at Journal of Political Economy. You see that uh, in that paper, we fit the baseline investment model uh, with only one capital, which is the physical uh, capital, like PP and E, tangible investment, tangible asset. Right, so you see that the A is the uh, adjustment cost parameter. It varies from the SUE decils. SUE stands for standardized unexpected earnings. So that's the post earnings announcement drift or earnings momentum decils. You see that the A estimate is 7.7 .7 when we fit the model on 10 SUE decils, but A parameter becomes 22.3. When we, sit, when we fit the baseline model on 10 book to market decimals. So it varies uh, with testing portfolios and the CI stands for corporate investment. Uh, this Tittman way and shear uh, variable, you see the A parameter becomes only one. So it varies. Uh, so is the curvature parameter in the production function 0 0.3, 0 0.5 and 0 0.2. So you see in particular between earnings momentum and the book to market and value and the momentum. So the model requires different point estimates for adjustment cost, as well as the curvature parameter to fit the, to fit the average return spreads. In other words, um, it indicates the investment model fails to explain value and the momentum. Uh, simultaneously, we verify that conjecture uh, in a joint paper with Laura Liu 2014, at Journal of Monetary Economics. So the right panel is a scatter plot of average predicted returns against average realized returns in the data. We are using three by three uh, joint sorted two-way source portfolios on momentum and the book to market. You see that the baseline investment model fits momentum pretty well, uh, winner, loser. So it's a healthy spread within the model. Uh, winner, loser again, winner, loser again, uh, within each of the book to market turns out. Whereas if you look at the value minus growth, we're getting the sign of average return spread upside down, right? In the data, value beats growth. Um, whereas in the model, growth beats value. So the model fails. Um, uh, in explaining value and the momentum simultaneously, in particular in the joint estimation, the GMM just want, wants to fit the momentum while largely ignores value. Um, all right, so we have largely resolved this empirical difficulty in our prior work in this new paper, in this more recent paper. So this is the scatter plot from the structure model in this paper. Uh, again, we have average predicted returns on the vertical axis out of our model against average realized returns in the data. The left panel is we are fitting value and momentum decile simultaneously. You see winner beats loser, value beats growth. And all 20 scatter observations are aligned mostly along the 45 degree line. And now the fit is not perfect. You see some alphas right here, 
Uh, but overall, the general pattern, it's quite a bit of improvement relative to uh, our prior work um, five, six years ago. The right scatter plot on this slide, this is when we fit the model on value momentum investment and the return on equity decimals simultaneously. So again, the alignment is reasonably good in the sense that they are largely, the scatter points are largely aligned along the 45 degree line. So winner still beats loser pretty nicely and the value beats growth right there. So we are, we are, we are not generating any obvious anomaly with, uh, within this framework. All right. The rest of the presentation is organized as follows. I will first describe the economic model, then present the econometric methods, describe the data, and present the GMM estimation test results. And then finally, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the point estimates from the model and then and then explore uh, other implications, other model moments that do not directly enter our GMM uh, estimation. Uh, to serve as diagnostics of, uh, of the model. Um, in that case, we are looking at higher moments, basically not just the average return in the estimation, we're looking at the dynamics of different factor premiums. All right, economic model. So in, um, so relative to the um, uh, baseline physical capital model, uh, simplest possible setup in Liu, Wei, and Zhang, uh, 2009. So in this paper, we introduce working capital. So in, in addition to physical capital, this is PP&E, uh, we also have working capital, right? Cash, accounts, receivables, and inventory, right? These are the three major components of working capital. And uh, that's K and W and X is a vector of exogenous shocks that the firm takes as given. Uh, this include some aggregate shocks, industry specific shocks and firm specific shocks. So we're gonna stick with constant returns to scale and in order to derive investment return later on and Cobb Douglas, and this is a standard way to parameterize the marginal product of capital. Capital accumulation, next period, physical capital equals current period, physical capital, net of depreciation plus new investment. Right, and delta is the rate of tangible capital, uh, is the depreciation rate for tangible capital. And W is next period working capital equals current period working capital and plus new working capital investment. So we are simply defining working capital investment as changes in working capital, right? Uh, for simplicity, we assume working capital doesn't depreciate, all right? So most of working capital, it's you know turned around within an accounting site within one operating cycle. So it's relatively short term. So for simplicity, we're gonna say, look, no depreciation to keep things simple in our econometric work. So adjustment costs on physical capital, same as before, we're using the standard quadratic term. And for parsimony, we assume there are no adjustment costs on working capital. Now in the internet appendix, we did incorporate adjustment costs on working capital, but the most of the point estimates on the adjustment cost parameter on working capital are mostly small, economically small and statistically insignificant and the incremental uh, model performance uh, is limited. So we, again, we, we ruthlessly simplify. Uh, we, just, we just discard the working capital adjustment costs altogether. Now, what, why working capital, right? So why, I mean, there are, if we wanna introduce a different productive input, there are many, many choices like labor and more recently intangible capital has received a lot of attention. Why do we stick with working capital? Well, the fraction of PPE and T that's net PP uh, property plan equipment in the sum of in the in what we call total capital measured in this paper, sum of PPE and T and working capital uh, that accounts for cash, accounts receivables, and inventory in the measurement, we simply use current assets in that. 
So it turns out the fraction of PBENT over the sum of PBENT and the current assets is only 38% on average. So there are more, there are, there, are, there are quite a bit more working capital than PBENT, all right? So although working capital looks very ordinary and banal and probably boring, but working capital is essential to a firm's daily operations. You have to have cash to pay the workers when the you know um, accounting period comes. You have to pay wages and all, and you need to maintain trade credit, uh, maintain account receivables in order to um, boost your sales and uh, of course inventory. You, you need to keep the materials and um, uh, in store to, uh, to smooth production. Um, all right, so, so working capital is an um, integral part of the firm's growth process. So it's, um, it's, a, it's part of the productive input in a, in a, in a grand scheme of things. Um, so that's why, so, uh, so we stick with working capital because it's the most ordinary, oftentimes it's easy to be ignored, but it's essential, all right? So why no labor? Well, immediate the empirical challenge is that uh, 80, more than 80% of firm your observations in computes that um, are missing wages data. Uh, you can do some imputation based on BEA industry level wages data, but still that's imputation revolves noise, right? So, and and uh, um, moreover, unlike working capital, without adjustment costs, labor does not enter expect return equation. So bottom line is that without labor, most of the expenses are current period expenses, right? They are static, current period expenses that get absorbed into the operating profit function. Only with adjustment costs, some of the labor hiring is gonna deliver future payoff for the firm. And that's the accounting definition of long-term asset. And then labor shows up, right? In the firm va valuation. Um, uh, however, labor doesn't show up in balance sheet unlike working capital. All right, I'll, I may come back to this point later. So why no intangibles? Um, again, the, um, my take on the intangible literature is that measurement errors in intangible investment flows, amortization rates, impairment rules under uncertainty, this come with a huge amount of measurement errors and uh, and uh, and um, and my sense is that uh, we are quite a bit reluctant to introduce all these measurement errors in our uh, cost of capital model and in our structural estimation. And on top of that, uh, in our experience, matching expected return moments and evaluation moments, uh, they oftentimes require different information, right? Although. Although theoretically speaking, we are looking at the same model, the structural parameters are gonna be identical. That's theoretical ideal. In practice, um, the valuation moment and expect return moment contain different information. So um, taking a one step back, I think my take of the intangibles is that I would rather take the market price as given, market value as given to infer intangible value than the other way around. Then trying to using accounting available accounting data on intangibles, which are highly incomplete to trying to figure out the intrinsic value. So again, we can debate about, you know, from my own prejudices that I feel comfortable uh, taking the market price as at least as first approximation, the, you know, quote unquote, the right price, right? On the other hand, this is, this is in accounting, this is fair value accounting. Uh, fair value accounting and, uh, and, um, and uh, it's actually, you know, it is controversial, but it's not totally unreasonable. So my take is that I would rather take the, whatever investors are paying for the market value uh, for the firm in order to infer about the intangible, the value of the intangibles instead of the other way around. Uh, because again, accounting data on intangible are just highly incomplete. All right, so that's the, that's, the, that's the rationale behind our um, modeling. Uh, in terms of uh, 
first order condition, we have two productive inputs in the operating profits function, and you can set up the model, solve the first order conditions. Uh, everything is very straightforward. And then you get the conditional expectation times uh, of pricing kernel times uh, physical capital investment return equals one. And RK is the investment return. Again, the formulation is um, uh, it's virtually identical uh, from, uh, from our prior work. Um, so the numerator is the marginal benefit of investment. The denominator is the marginal cost of investment. Okay, so um, uh, you, if you wanna dig a little bit more, please see my uh, prior video presentation on Liu Wed and Zhang, uh, 2009 article in which I went into quite a bit more detail in terms of interpreting each specific term. Uh, both in the numerator and in the, in the denominator. But for now, so uh, let me just say the investment return is a quantitative trade-off between marginal cost of, sorry, between marginal cost of physical investment today, that is in the numerator, and the marginal benefit of physical capital investment uh, at t plus one next period, that's in the numerator, all right? So for working capital investment, we have something similar the conditional expectation of the pricing kernel times working capital investment return equals one. And the working capital investment return is given by this formulation. And uh, so this term is basically marginal product of working capital, right? And is proportional to sales to working capital ratio, okay, as standard uh, approximation, a standard parameterization from the investment literature in, in, in macro and corporate finance, uh, because there's no, because there is no working, working capital adjustment costs. So the denominator, right? So it's, so that's zero. And then we, we only have one in the denominator. So we, 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 we scale, we normalize the price of physical capital goods and working capital goods to be one, to be identical. So one is only, so this is the only component, all right? And then there's no depreciation. So one is left to be, you know, one numerator there. So bottom line is that you have physical capital investment and working capital investment, and you can combine them together and they extend our earlier proposition that the weighted average, that the investment return equals the weighted average cost of capital as derived in Liu Wed and Zhang with the, with, the, with the working capital. So it's one thing I love to work with the uh, newer classical framework is that is fruitful, all right? So you have, a, you have a core, you have a hard core in the research program and you can do it all kinds of extensions in order to understand the world better. So in this, in this paper, we extend along the dimension of working capital, as well as a different um, uh, aggregation from firm level return to portfolio level return. And as a result, empirical performance is uh, substantially improved. All right, so weighted average of the investment return. So WK is the value, the market value, Q is marginal Q. So Q times K is the market value of physical capital divided by the sum of you know two capital uh, goods that the firm holds, and that the marginal Q for working capital is one. Again, no adjustment cost. Um, so if you look at the left hand side, we have value weighted investment return, both for physical capital investment return and working capital investment return. So going back to the previous slide, you see that's a technological concept. It's not the financial concept. Right, so this is both physical capital investment return and working capital investment return. These are all related to technologies, both in production and the physical capital adjustment cost. Uh, the right hand side of the equation is a fairly standard uh, weighted average cost of capital and WB is market leverage. And what we call the investment cap and you solve for uh, stock return and that's basically stock return. It's uh, uh, fund what we call fundamental return is it's a basically levered version of the weighted average of two investment returns. Okay, so again, just like our prior work, all the variables, all the variables in the left hand side are either uh, structural parameters, uh, gamma k, gamma w, and a parameter, and plus real data that we can measure 
directly out of CompuState. Now we can debate uh, the quality of the approximation in CompuState data, but at least we're making contact with real data, uh, which uh, in our opinion is it's important. All right, so that's the model, all right? That's the model. Again, this weighted average cost of capital framework uh, extended with the uh, two capital model. Econometric method. So uh, we're gonna test the expected return of the stock return of portfolios equal to um, the expected fundamental return, the fundamental return, all right, from the model. And uh, it's, uh, so again, as I explained in a prior video presentation, so we're focusing on the expected return because the cross-section of returns literature is about the cross-section of expected returns. All right, so, and that's the portfolio stock return and the RF, big F, uh, not risk free rate. So apologies for the notation. Uh, F stands for fundamental, right? And the investment cap M alpha or model error is basically the sample equivalent of that moment condition. So a technical point is that, uh, so the two parameter, curvature parameter, Going back earlier, right? The, so we are we are we are parameterizing the marginal product of physical capital as proportional to sales to physical capital, gamma k times y over k, all right? And then we are parameterizing the marginal product of working capital as proportional to sales to working capital, and the proportionality parameter is gamma w. It turns out in the model, if you write out the, the weighted average of investment returns, two investment returns, you see that gamma K and gamma W enter the picture only through their sum, their summation, which we call gamma. And on top of that, the marginal product of capital is sales divided is proportional to sales divided by total capital, which is the sum of physical capital and working capital. In other words, sales divided by total capital is, should be the right measure of average product of capital. Okay. And that's an important point empirically, which I will return later. All right, GMM is based on Lars's influential work. It's all standard. Uh, uh, we do first stage GMM following Cochrane 1996 in order to focus on the uh, economic structure of the testing portfolios and the over identification test, right? To see whether uh, it's like um, similar to the to the to the F test in Gibbons and Russian Schenken, where see where we're trying to check whether the model implied alphas are jointly zero across a given set of decimals. Right. So another, in addition to working capital as a, a, a additional productive input, another conceptual innovation of our paper is the aggregation. Uh, procedure. So in our prior work in Liu Wei and Zhang and Liu and Zhang, so we 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 implement all the estimation at the portfolio level. In other words, we construct, we aggregate firm characteristics to the portfolio level, all right, and then construct portfolio level fundamental return, and to match with portfolio level stock returns. And that's the, that's the moment condition implemented in our prior work. So NPT, this number of firms in portfolio P, okay? So W could be either equal weights or value weights. And this first term in front of the minus sign, that's the portfolio stock return. Behind the minus sign, the whole thing is the portfolio level fundamental return. And these are portfolio level characteristics and we calculate the portfolio level characteristics by adding up all the characteristics across all the firms within that portfolio. So this aggregation scheme follows Pharma French 1995. Okay, so this is the portfolio level aggregation. So at the time, so what, what we were worried about is really so lumpiness, lumpy investment behavior. At the, at the micro level, at the firm level, and we were working with the quadratic adjustment cost, 
So we are hoping, you know, uh, doing so by aggregating, by handling all the um, portfolios as one big uh, conglomerate uh, to, to, to smooth some of the uh, wild uh, firm level behavior. We are hoping to give the model uh, a good chance at feeding the data, at least as a first step, but we have done that. You know, we have documented some empirical deficiencies and we are hoping to see whether we, we can improve things further in this paper, all right? The way we improve is to pursue uh, what we uh, view as exact aggregation. In other words, we're gonna construct firm level fundamental returns directly from firm level accounting variables. And then we aggregate for the, to the portfolio level fundamental returns. So again, the term in front of the minus sign is the portfolio level stock return aggregated from firm level stock return as before. Now behind the minus sign, we're gonna uh, work with the firm level characteristics directly to construct a firm level fundamental return. And then we're gonna aggregate firm level fundamental return to the portfolio level using the same weighting scheme as the weighting scheme, the stock return, either equal weights or value weights, and then we're gonna match the mean together in this way, right? So why do we do that, right? So in this way, individual firm is an individual firm. Uh, individual firm can make different uh, investment uh, choices for different investment rules. This seems uh, reasonable. And, uh, and on top of that, substantial firm, empirically substantial firm level heterogeneity helps identify the structural parameters. Okay. Oh, I should mention that, uh, that because the two gammas enter the weighted average investment returns as in terms of their sum, gamma. So the two capital model has only two parameters, gamma and the A parameter, all right? The adjustment cost parameter for physical capital because there's no adjustment cost on working capital. In, as a result, the two capital model, just like the one capital model also has two parameters. So the two capital model is as parsimonious as the physical capital model with only two parameters. So this facilitates comparison uh, with the prior literature. All right, let me let me let me describe the data we use. So we use testing decimals again. Uh, we are um, although we construct uh, fundamental return at the firm level, but our moment conditions are still looking at the portfolio level uh, stock returns. Um, again, I'm a very fond of the portfolio approach in empirical asset pricing because uh, because you diversify away this incredible volatility, uh, you increase the power of your test in terms of average return spread across portfolios is large and uh, with small standard errors. So 40 testing deciles formed on book to market momentum and uh, investment or asset growth and ROE, return on equity. So now after rhythm, um, the replicating anomalies, we're going to stick with NYC breakpoints and evaluated returns. In the internet appendix, we reported the, all but the micro breakpoints and equal weighted returns. All but the micro means that we get rid of all the micro caps. These are like below market market equity, below 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 forty. Sorry, below twenty twenty percentile of NYC breakpoints, and we get rid of. Uh, all those micro caps from the sample using the remaining stocks to form breakpoints, that's our breakpoints, and then take equal weighted returns. So the results in general are quite a bit stronger than value weighted uh, results. The reason is that equal weighted results, uh, average portfolio returns um, increase the bar for our model to, uh, to fit, for any model to fit. As a result, our incremental improvement vis-a-vis -vis the prior literature is bigger with equal weighted results. Okay. All right. So, all right. I just had to explain the last point. So, um, average returns of the forty testing deciles um, book to market. This ends the sample. It uh, ends in June two thousand seventeen in um, in the published paper. Um, so we still see quite a bit of value premium. 
uh, later on, if you extend to December 2020, and that T value is not going to be significant anymore, and the average return is going to be quite a bit lower, you know, low 30s. So, so investment, that's so. how. So again, NYSE breakpoints and value weighted returns. So this average, this investment decile return is a bit lower than what we reported in the Q factor paper uh, because our sample in this paper uh, requires lots of data items to construct a fundamental return. As a, you know, as a result, the sample is tilted a bit towards bigger firms, larger firms. The investment premium is a bit lower, right? So the R11, uh, this is a, 11 1 um, price momentum uh, following the construction of Pharma French 1996. So it's quite a bit higher, right? 1.1, 1 .1, uh, then 66 momentum, 1.12% per month. And ROE premium 68 basis points per month, and significant T value above three. Now let me get to the measurement of uh, variables. So taking the theoretical model to the data requires quite a bit of thoughts, okay? And we've been improving the matching um, steadily over the years. Um, um, and we're still improving it in our ongoing work. So how should one measure capital, right? So we're going to be using net PP&E. In, in our first paper in this line work, in Liu Wet and Zen, we were using gross PPE. Uh, later on in our 2014 GME article, Laura and I switched to net PPE. And this is why, right? So conceptually, conceptually, net PPE should be the measure of capital within the economic model, not gross PPE. And this is why. Start with the capital accumulation equation for each period. Uh, date zero could be the funding date of a firm. All right, so it could be the you know funding. Let's just say the firm uh, becomes alive. All right, so new entrant in the economy. Not not necessarily the first year shows up in CompuStat. Right, so uh, the funding date. Right, and then what you do is that you plug in the right hand side of the first equation into Ki1 in the second equation. Recursively, you plug the Ki2 into the right hand side of the second equation into Ki2 in the third equation, and you keep going until you plug Kit plus one into the last equation. You collect all the terms, you're gonna you're gonna look at the last equation, all right? It says that KIT, the capital IT in, in your economic model is it's all the, the summation of all your past investment expenses, investment expenditures, plus the initial date, initial value of capital, right? And the minus cumulative cu accumulated uh, depreciation, all right? So delta times K, that's a flow variable uh, within each period. And you have to aggregate them all up across the firm's existing life, all right? That's a stock variable uh, called accumulated depreciation. So you can see that in accounting, so the first, the first item, the first term is actually gross PPE. Right in financial accounting, that's gross PPE. That's all your accumulated past investment expenditure. And the gross PPE minus accumulated depreciation, it should be net PPE. That's why we need to use net PPE as a measure of capital. And in the data in CompuStat, the ratio of a net PPE over gross PPE is on average 56%. In other words, 44% of gross PPE is actually depreciated away, right? So it doesn't enter, presumably it doesn't enter your production function, right? So, and the, and the fifth and 95th percentile is 0 0.3 and 0 0.83. So bottom line is that there's a quite a bit of difference between a net PPE and a gross PPE 
uh, for a while, I thought the growth and net, how big a difference is that, right? And I was, I had in mind just a flow variable, flow depreciation, just one period expense on depreciation. That's not true. In accounting, is actually accumulated depreciation, and that's a gigantic number. That's more than forty percent of gross PPE, right? So gross PPE, that's a that's a small managerial accounting literature I've recently. Uh, um, uh, get exposed to uh, that tries to justify the use of gross PPE as capital under uh, the, what the economists call one horse shape pattern of depreciation is like uh, capital, right? Maintains throughout its life, maintain the constant efficiency pattern and then boom and then collapse. And then it, you know, the efficiency drops to zero. It's like a light bulb, right? It, on the elasticity, you turn it on, it gives you light, and then it blows up and then it drops to zero and then it goes out of order and then the value is zero. So 100%, 100%, 100, 100 con constant efficiency pattern that at the end of the capital service life and then goes to zero immediately. So only under that efficiency, under that economic depreciation pattern and only gross PPE, under, only under that extreme unrealistic scenario, gross PPE should be the measure of capital. But under that scenario, gross PPE equals net PPE before the 100% before, before the, before the job at the end of the life, right? When the, when the capital is still alive, under that condition, gross PPE equals net PPE. So why why not just go ahead and use net PPE? So that's the thinking process. Now, all this consideration assumes that the accounting depreciation is a reasonable depreciation scheme, and I'm not defend I'm not defending that assumption. So I'm just saying, given this is the data we have, you encompass that, and we should just use the data. Uh, now I'm completely open that we should um, explore different uh, um, economic depreciation. So, but then that requires you to reconstruct all the all the capital stock altogether. All right. So most so that's how we stick with uh, um, how we measure capital stock. We are we are using historical cost accounting. Uh, that's the financial accounting encompasses that data set. Um, so now when it comes to Investment measures, most prior studies using CapEx minus sales on PBE. And then when we were writing this paper, we stumbled on the fact that once we measure capital as PBE NT, right? It turns out the difference between this measure of investment and whatever investment measure out of the capital, capital accumulation equation have a big difference. This investment measure deviates from capital accumulation quite frequently and economically large, the deviation. For 5% of firm year observations, the deviation is more than 57% of PPE NT. For 10, more than 10% of the firm year observations is 31%. 25%, the deviation is more than 10%. I should mention the depreciation rate is accounting depreciation rate. It's amount of depreciation. Uh, you know, we take care of uh, amortization because it's for intangibles booked on the balance sheet, scaled by PBENT. PBE and then we uh, dig a bit deeper into the accounting literature. So why would the investment measured from cash flow statement deviates so much from the balance sheet implied? investment flows, right? I mean, could be many reasons. Um, a leading reason is the mergers acquisitions, right? The mergers acquisitions, the, the acquisition of PP and E through mergers acquisitions doesn't show up uh, in the cash flow um, item. Uh, CapEx doesn't show up in CapEx minus sales. It show, shows up in AQC, item number AQ. I can uh, label AQC, but the AQC includes not just PP, new PPE and uh, new, new PPE and E acquisition. It includes many other things like working capital, current assets, right? Uh, it includes uh, some goodwill and, uh, and uh, all, all mixed up together. The measurement is, uh, becomes a big, uh, big headache. Capital lease is also not included 
in this flow measure of investment, capital lease is basically a uh, new PPE acquisition financed by debt, right? And that doesn't involve uh, cash flow. So that doesn't show up in that measure of CapEx also, right? Asset exchanges, restructural charges, impairment loss, none of which involve cash flow. So, but, it, but all these changes in um, uh, PPENT will show up on balance sheet. So we, so in, so with all these considerations, we just went ahead and measure investment uh, backed out from, from balance sheet PPENT net of um, accounting uh, depreciation bottom line is that investment is change in PPENT plus the accounting depreciation of PPENT. At the time, we thought we figured out something new, something cool. And then later on, this is after the paper was published. So we did uh, look into the literature a little bit more and turns out Hayashi and Inno 1991, as it is that papers at Econometrica on Japanese data and Llewellyn and Bachneth 1997 paper at GFE, uh, the GFE, the prior two papers already use this measure of investment. Okay, we will fix the citations going forward uh, in our future papers. All right, so measurement of other variables and sales for output, current assets on working capital. So in the accounting literature, so working capital is often measured as net assets minus, sorry, as current assets minus current liability to measure net working capital. Because in our economic modeling, we're only modeling the asset side of the um, of the of the balance sheet. So we're gonna we're gonna ignore the, um, the liability side. And as an asset, the investment capital literature so far is all about asset side, right? So I'm. Um, you know, chances are the liability side has a lot of implications. And so far, it's a totally virgin territory that, you know, um, uh, maybe, 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 maybe future, maybe researchers can enter that, you know, big virgin ter territory going forward. Right. So, so uh, that is basically book value of debt. So as a proxy for market value of debt, again, fairly standard, long-term debt plus short-term debt, uh, market equity, uh, same fairly standard. So um, corporate tax rate, and then we measure a bond return using, uh, we, we're basically just using firm level compute that data, total interest expenses scaled by total debt, uh, increased sample coverage relative to the credit rating imputation procedure we used earlier, increased the sample coverage by 12.7%. Also, the results are fairly, fairly close. And on top of that, it increases a lot of the firm level heterogeneity, right? So that again, the challenge is that the, the, the available data on the cross section of corporate bonds is way smaller than the available data than you know the equity return cross section of equity return that we are so fond of working with right so and that's uh, that's the best measurement that we can come up with at this point timing alignment uh, so so in lieu weddings and 2009 article we implemented the annual estimation. So in lieu of adding some, we extend that to monthly uh, estimation thereby increasing the power of our test. So we construct monthly fundamental returns from annual accounting variables to match with monthly stock returns. All right. So how do we construct the monthly fundamental returns of our annual out of annual accounting variables? Well, this is what we handle it. For each month T, we take firm level accounting variables from the fiscal year and closest to month T to measure for time T variable in the model, All right? This is the flow variable as explained in the paper. Uh, the stock variable is one year lagged because stock variable in the model is measured at the beginning of the period within the model, but in CompuStat, uh, everything is at the end of the um, accounting period. All right. So, and, the, and then we take the accounting variables from the subsequent physical year and to measure time T plus one uh, flow variables, right? So the details are in the paper. Uh, that's, that's been quite a bit of thoughts that have gone into uh, the, the timing alignment between, uh, between, between, between 
um, between between matching the economic model with the counting data. Uh, so this, right. And also in, uh, in our 2009 article, we only include the firms with December fiscal year end. Now in, in our 2014 article, we include firms with all kinds of fiscal year end, right? It turns out December fiscal year end has only from year observations about, you know, 60%, slightly above 60% of the firm your observations in CompuStat. So it's quite a bit of um, 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 observations are missing, but, but fortunately the basic results are not that affected um, uh, even quantitatively. But then nevertheless, we, we, improve, we improve the accuracy um, sample coverage in lieu of and exam by using the monthly estimation. Uh, we include uh, different firms with all kinds of physical year end. Right. And the, the last point on this slide is innovation within this paper, the 2020 uh, RFS paper. We compound the portfolio stock return, right? Within a 12 month rolling window within month T to match with the portfolio fundamental return from month T. So basically, if you look at the second point, we were saying, right? So for each month T, you got, you're, not, you're gonna get you're going to grab accounting variables in CompuStat from the physical year and the closest to that month. And we define that as time t within the model and the subsequent physical year end as t plus one in the model, right? But the stock return for that month is only for that month. But when you construct a fundamental return for that month, the information both comes from before and after that month. Right. So, and then fundamental return because it's constructed out of annual accounting variables. Fundamental return is in annual terms, and uh, that month stock return is in monthly term. In Liu and Zhang 2014, we basically annualize that month stock return and match that with the fundamental return constructed accordingly. Right. But that involves some timing match, mismatch because stock return is only for that month, but fundamental return constructed for that month, both grabs information before and after that month out of the uh, financial statements, right? So, so in this paper, we improve on the timing match by compound the portfolio stock return within a 12 month rolling window surrounding with that month T in the middle, right? So, and then that's basically now the stock return, which is annualized counts both before and after that month. So roughly speaking, that matches the whatever portfolio fundamental return we constructed for that month. And this turns out the improves the estimation results, uh, especially the correlation structure that I will show you later on. All right, let's look at the, let's look at the, uh, what our sample look like with the, with the timing alignment uh, and all. So this is the each month we can construct a fundamental return. The sample goes from June 67 to December 2016. Uh, but keep in mind for that month, some of the accounting variables come from before actually can go, can go back to December 65. And the end of the sample can go, can be as late as May 2018. So the back guiding principle of our sample construction is to maximize sample coverage, both in the cross section as well as over time, right? So, and because of the timing alignment, the monthly grabbed from, you know, grabbing each month, we grab annual accounting data, both before and after the month. So, um, well, keep that in mind. I will, I will explain the relevance of that procedure for the auto correlations. Right, so if you see the I over K, which is the investment rate, so the mean may be may look a bit surprising to you. It's pretty high, right? The mean investment rate is historical cost investment rate is th is thirty six percent, right? So there are multiple reasons. The main leading reason is because we are using PPE NT. If you P if you use gross PPE, the mean jumps to about. 19, 20%, I'm relying on my memory again, which is not reliable, 
So you should check the specific statistics reported in the paper. Another important reason is that this thing, investment rate is highly skewed, right? To the, right, with the long right tail, the median is only 23%, whilst the mean is 36%. 25th percentile is 11 percent, 75th percentile is 44 percent. Fifth percentile, you see negative investment. The 95th percentile, you see 1.33. Let's see, what other important um, statistics I should highlight? Right, so this uh, physical capital out as a fraction of total capital on average is only 38 percent. So the working capital is higher than physical capital, okay? Marginal, or I should say, sales to total capital on average is 1.62. Not that skewed, it's, very, it's relatively close to 1.5, which is the medium. But if you look at the sales to physical capital, we are seeing a lot of uh, skewness going on. On average, is 9.05. The median is only 5.2. All right, correlation structure. So autocorrelation is 32% for investment rate. And this is a bit inflated because our monthly alignment out of annual accounting data. If you just look at the annual accounting data directly, and that autocorrelation drops to about the low 20s. Okay, so it's a little bit... Uh, um, in inflation inflated uh, out of our timing alignment procedure. If you look at working capital investment rate, despite our, you know, timing alignment monthly from annual, the auto correlation for working capital investment is only 4%. It's very close to zero. This is consistent with our modeling of no adjustment costs for working capital. So firms are free to adjust working capital wherever you want, but you cannot do that for physical capital. Working capital investment and the, and the physical capital investment are positively correlated, okay, 30%. So firm level distribution histogram, this is the histogram firm distribution versus portfolio level distribution investment rate. So we are doing uh, 2.5, 97.5 visualization. Despite the visualization, you see work, physical capital investment rate is asymmetric, skewed to the, to the right with the long right tail, okay? So, so positive investment tail is way longer than the negative investment tail. But if you aggregate everything to the portfolio level, it becomes much better behaved. Okay, with, without a whole lot of distribution, uh, dispersion in the cross section. So the fraction of physical capital out of total capital, because it's, the fraction is already between zero and one, so we don't do any winsorization. So this is what you have at the firm level. This is what you're gonna see once you aggregate everything to the portfolio level. Although we do not do, do implement this step in our benchmark, estimation, we did implement this step in some of the comparative statics to quantify the important importance of aggregation procedure, for example. So this is the uh, sales to total capital because it's bounded below zero. So we do zero then 95% of initialization. Firm level distribution, quite a bit dispersed, not the whole much in the portfolio level variation. Uh, this is a hugely informative figure. Sales to physical capital, again, bounded from below, we simply did a zero and 95% winsorization. Despite the 95% winsorization, you see it's completely wild, extremely long right tail, skewed to the left, skewed to the right, right? And this, this is why, um, right, we were having all kinds of problems with the ba baseline model, right? And once you aggregate the baseline physical capital model, one capital model, once you aggregate everything to the portfolio level is less dispersed. So bond return 
uh, quite a bit of mess at zero because quite a bit of firms have no leverage. We just assume zero cost of debt. You don't pay interest and then cost of debt is zero. Aggregate of portfolio level and you know, less degree of heterogeneity. Now let me get into the GMM estimation and tests. We start by replicating our prior work, the one capital baseline investment model estimated at the portfolio level. This is the portfolio level aggregation that Laura, Tony and I implemented in our 2009 article. So you see that we're using value weighted returns in this table, whilst the prior study used equal weighted returns. So we see some parameter instability, the A parameter for a for book to market decile, it's 6.3, whereas for momentum decile is 1.3. Uh, in the internet appendix for this paper, we reported all but the micro breakpoints and equal weighted results. And there, so the parameter instability is even more severe. So we are, again, I'm relying on my memory now. So I think uh, you can check the original, uh, you can check the, the statistics reported in the paper. I think it's, it's the differences between 15 versus one. Okay, quite a bit of instability. But even for value-weighted returns, you see the model does pretty well, uh, fitting value and the momentum separately. The high minus low alpha is not that big. 0.3% is per year, I mean, that's a small number. 1.5% is not that big either. But the once we do the joint estimation value and the momentum simultaneously, the model basically is focusing on momentum with a relatively small adjustment cost, 2.5 ignores the value. As a result, the average high minus low error alpha is 7%. That's a big number, 7% per year is a big number. Because by doing a monthly estimation, the, the model is, the test is powerful now, has a lot of power. Now we are rejecting the model, which is good in our view. Um, all 40 deciles together, value, momentum, investment, and ROE, right? The model is rejected again. So let's look at the scatter plots. So this basically replicate whatever uh, uh, Laura and I put together for the two by three, two, uh, for three by three value and the momentum uh, estimated earlier. But in this case, we're doing uh, 10 value decile, book market deciles and 10 um, R11 decile, 10 momentum deciles. You can see using the one capital model and the portfolio level old style aggregation, uh, the model is able to fit momentum, although with some alpha left, but the value premium is negative in the model. In other words, the model cannot simultaneously explain value and the momentum, right? In particular, if you look at the value premium alpha, uh, high minus slow, we are getting pretty big alpha for value premium, 8.85% per year and the significant. If we add simultaneously value momentum investment and the ROE deciles, the low minus high becomes even more negative. The alpha is 11.11% per year and the T value is going through the roof, 3.9. Okay, so this replicates our prior work. Now let's look at what we have managed to accomplish in this article. The two capital model with the exact aggregation estimated at the firm level. So first notion is that you see the parameters are more stable. Okay, so in the again in the equal weighted return case, the improvement is much more conspicuous. But the bottom line is that even with value weighted decile as testing assets, you see the, the joint estimation error is only high minus low on average. Alpha is only 0.77%. This is per year. This is actually quite small. 
although the model is still retracted, but we are happy with the low economic magnitude for the error. Even when we throw in all 40 testing deciles together, the high mass low alpha is on average 1.7% per year, which is not that big. Scatter plots. Uh, the left panel is valuing the momentum simultaneously. Winner minus loser, value minus growth. We see the model, the model is fitting pretty well. So in terms of value premium alpha, this is our benchmark estimation with two capital model estimated at the firm level, basically with the exact aggregation. You see the value premium alpha is only 1.18% uh, per year. And this is an improvement relative to 8.85% per year in the prior literature. With all 40 deciles together, we're still looking at larger, mostly uh, alignment along the 45 degree line. Um, in particular, value premium, high minus low, we are looking at the alpha is 3.09%, not the small number, uh, but relative to 11.11% .11 in our prior uh, work, uh, we, we believe this is a sub substantial improvement. Right, so let's look at the economic mechanism. So what's going on? And, uh, and uh, the physical, so the deeper economic mechanism. So let's look at the physical capital investment return, right? So it's the same also shows up in the baseline one capital model. So it turns out current investment and next period the investment are stuck in a tug of war whenever the current investment dominates next period investment, we see value and the investment premiums. Otherwise, when the expected investment with next period investment dominates current investment, we see momentum and the ROE premium. And we implemented the same comparative statics um, as we implemented in our prior work in 2009 JPE article. Uh, but uh, we're, we're doing, but now literally we have firm level uh, observations. We handle firm level observations basically. So the first row is the benchmark high minus low alphas out of all 40 testing deciles joint estimation. In the second row, we are fixing the I over K investment rate for all the firms at the cross-sectional median, not the mean level in our prior work, because now we're dealing with the firm level estimation. We, there's a lot of skewness going on. So we just fix at the median level. So we fix the, the median level thereby eliminating all the cross-sectional variation in the investment rate across all the firms. So, and then we look at the resulting high minus low alpha. If that resulting alpha is much bigger than the benchmark alpha, then we say the cross-sectional uh, variation in this, the, in, the, in this characteristic is really important, or that is really important, quote unquote, determinant of the cross-section of expected returns. So in this case, we can see that investment rate cross-sectional variation of investment rate is clearly the most important determinant of the value premium. If you eliminate the cross-sectional dispersion in investment rate, the, in our, our model implied the value premium is gonna generate a gigantic alpha of 36%. It turns out the next period investment to asset strongly goes the wrong way, right? Eliminate that distribution, you generate the value premium strongly and negative goes the other way. Uh, in other words, for the value premium, the denominator and numerator are stuck in a tug of war. They're dragging the expected return towards two different directions. But for value premium, it's the denominator that is the dominating force. Okay, and therefore we see the positive value premium. And that's what that's what that's what we read out of these two uh, statistics. So, average product of capital has some influence as well, but not the big deal. 
Now the exact opposite is true for momentum. Eliminate the denominator i over k, you are generating a negative alpha 7.7 .7 per year. But if you eliminate the cross-sectional dispersion in next period, investment rate, you are, you are generating a gigantic positive alpha of 20.7%. Go back to this equation again. Again, the current period investment in the, in the denominator and next period investment rate in the numerator are stuck in a tug of war for momentum as well. But for momentum, it's the, it's the next period investment that is the dominating force, right? So as a result, momentum winner and is, like, is, is earning higher rates of returns than momentum losers. So, so intriguingly, according to our model, value and the momentum in a sense are derived from the same, a highly similar, if not identical economic mechanism. It's just the two forces, current investment and next period investment are dragging expected return towards opposite directions. For value, current investment is winning. For momentum, uh, next period investment is winning, okay? And that's what we see from out of this comparative statics. So the results for investment premium and ROE premium are similar, although to a somewhat of a lesser degree. And I'm gonna skip the details. The mechanism is similar. So next we carefully document exactly uh, uh, what each innovation vis-a-vis -vis the prior work is buying in terms of improving, it's giving us, in, it's improving our overall economic um, empirical performance. The first, day, the first step we did is look at the role of aggregation. Now we implement, we estimate the two-factor model using portfolio level aggregation as in Liu, Wadi, and Zhang. Okay, so so, it's, but we have two capital model with working capital. You see, so the model performs reasonably well, uh, but the alphas are bigger. Okay, in particular for value premium alpha, we are looking at the high minus low there, although they are aligned along the 45 degree line. So we're looking at 3.5% per year alpha, whereas in the benchmark case, we're only looking at 1.2%. Moreover, once we to join estimation of all 40 testing deciles, value minus growth alpha becomes 4.94% uh, per year, whereas in the benchmark estimation is 3.09. Okay, somewhat bigger, uh, but overall is actually not that bad. So still value minus growth is still positive, although just bigger alpha. Now, it turns out capital heterogeneity uh, uh, is somewhat more important. So in this case, we're estimating the baseline physical capital, one factor, one capital model only, but using the exact aggregation estimated from firm value. Uh, now we see a bigger, bigger uh, error for value and the momentum, 20 decile joint estimation, the alpha becomes 4.75, okay? and bigger in the previous case, 3.5. And all 40 decile joint estimation, the value premium alpha is 8.52%, uh, whereas in the benchmark estimation, we only have about slightly above 3%. So bottom line is that the difficulty facing this model, physical capital model, even though it's using the correct firm level, exact aggregation is really the the long right tail of Y over K sales to physical capital is causing us a lot of trouble. The model can fit, but not nearly as good as our overall uh, benchmark estimation that handles uh, uh, working capital. All right, so in the final segment of the presentation, I'm gonna look at the diagnostics looking at the dynamics of factor premiums. So bottom line is that we're gonna, we're gonna take the benchmark point estimates out of all 40 deciles joint estimation, 
okay? We'll take the parameters as given, and then we're gonna plug in all the firm characteristics and see what the model implied the factor premiums of testing portfolio fundamental returns. How do those fundamental returns compare with observed portfolio stock returns? Not just the mean, but also volatility, skewness, higher moments and correlations or whatnot and tail probabilities, everything. The first table is the stock fundamental return correlations. First, we're comparing the correlations. In Liu Wedding Zhang paper, we report a correlation puzzle. So in that paper, the stock return and the fundamental return contemporaneously actually negatively correlated, whereas in theory, they should be identical, right? So in this paper, we, 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 we do not resolve the puzzle completely, but we help resolve the puzzle. Uh, we help resolve the puzzle. You see the correlations, uh, contemporaneous correlations are positive. At the portfolio level, mostly are positive, especially you look at high minus slow, it's like for investment, uh, high minus low DESA is 42% correlation. This is actually fairly decent. The reason is that we're using the 12 month rolling window, we are better align the timing of the fundamental return with the correct um, annual uh, stock return we're looking at. Because again, standing at time amongst T, we construct fundamental return for that month based on accounting information, annual accounting information, both before and after that month. Okay, and therefore we, we put the rolling window for the, for the annualized stock returns and turns out doing so a better, better align the timing. So bottom line is that correlation puzzle in my view, it's not that a big a deal. So it 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 speaks to some of the deficiencies of the of the data we have. We do not have monthly accounting information. <laughs> okay, we work with whatever data we have. Okay, and uh, hopefully we design the uh, empirical procedures to reflect to exploit whatever signal we can have from the data but we live with the data limitations. Right, so this is the value premium as noted earlier. So the current investment and the next investment are stuck in a tug of war. So when the, when the denominator is dominating, we see the value premium. It turns out in the event time when the denominator is dominating and that the average return pattern is much more long lasting. And this is the data in the stock return and this is the fundamental return. You see the dispersion is long lasting and in the data, you can go further, it lasts over five years. This is the event time. Uh, time zero is the portfolio formation date, portfolio formation year, and the vertical axis is the value premium. That's value, this is growth. You see it's long lasting, the spread is long lasting. And, uh, and in the internet appendix, we reported the, the spread in the growth rates, in the growth rate of marginal Q, it follows the same pattern. So in other words, value premium is long lasting after the portfolio formation. It is well known that the momentum is more short lived. All right. So this is, this is the uh, in event time, momentum that's winner, that's loser. Within 12 months, it flips the sign. That's winner, that's loser. For stock returns, momentum profits are short-lived. Within 12 months, it flipped the sign. That Laura and I first documented, uh, well, this, this in stock return pattern is pretty well known from Jack and Dish and Titman, right? So in our 2014 GME article, and Laura and I implemented the, the same event time study on the fundamental return. And we show that the fundamental returns follows the same pattern. It turns out the expected, it turns out the growth rate of marginal Q follows the same pattern. In other words, when, when, when the numerator, when next period of investment is dominating current period of investment, and that spread is much shorter lived than, than value and the investment. So I, I, I should mention that um, that this result is was unexpected. When Laura and I were writing our GME article, so we thought, you know, everybody knows momentum is short-lived. 
So we have we have we have an economic model built on economic fundamental ex ante. We thought there was no way we can match the short-lived nature of momentum, but we were like, you know what? Just go ahead and document the results and get it over with. And we were pleasantly we we actually quite comfortable reporting weaknesses of our uh, of our work, and we separate them. You know, we we consider that as an important part of our scientific reporting. And but we were pleasantly surprised in terms of the, the investment model can indeed explains the short-lived nature of momentum. And in this paper, uh, despite the new um, economic model with working capital, with the, work, with, the, with the new exact aggregation procedure, we retains that empirical uh, success that Laura and I first worked out in our 2014 article. And this is the uh, fundamental return in this paper. You see winner and the loser. Uh, winner beats loser, but after about 11, 12 months, it flips, okay? And quite similar than what you see in the data. So investment premium is a bit like value premium, is more longer lived, right? In the data, it flips, about, flips within 30 months. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the model, the model implied the fundamental return, it flips around the, you know, a little bit longer time, but it flips. So ROE premium is quite a bit like momentum. Within 12 months, it flips in the data, in the model implied a fundamental return premium for ROE premium flips as well, okay, within 12 months. So this is the dynamics of, uh, of the model. By the way, in our GMM estimation, we only estimate the parameters using average return moments. So all these short-lived dynamics, these moment conditions do not enter our GMM. This is a pure outside the benchmark estimation. This is a pure diagnostics, okay? Not exactly out of sample, but diagnostics. So check the additional moment to see if the model explains well. It turns out it does. Now let me show you the moments that the model does not do well which is uh, on volatility, right? So you see the fundamental return volatilities, volatilities are quite a bit lower than the corresponding stock return volatility, okay? Um, um, yeah, that's a weakness of the model. So in particular, in addition for momentum, and we know from, uh, from uh, um, uh, Daniel and uh, Moskowitz's influential work, uh, momentum crashes, right? So we see the negative skewness for momentum, but in the model, we see weakly positive skewness. We do observe in our time series plus reported in the paper, I do not have them in the presentation slides, we do see large momentum jobs, negative profits within the model, but not nearly as big as what, what you would see in the data. So the investment deciles and ROE deciles results are largely similar, uh, especially for volatility, although for the ROE decile high minus low, we have negative skewness as well. And the ketosis, we are kind of similar. Although for momentum, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are only one half of the ketosis you're observing the data. All right, so let me conclude. In this paper, we demonstrate that the detailed treatment of aggregation and the capital heterogeneity improves the performance of the investment cap M substantially in structural estimation. Thank you.